Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our services here at the Springdale Free Will Baptist Church, located in the area that we call Dutch Bend, just outside of Oxford, Mississippi. We want to welcome all who are here in the service, as well as those watching by way of our recording, and uh, just trust that you're having a blessed day. This is the Lord's Day. Um, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of 9-11 yesterday, and I will have a few things to share about that September 11th event and show how it does have some ties to the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, in a great and exciting way. Today we're going to finish chapter number 8 of the book of Revelation. Last Sunday we looked at the preparation of the trumpet judgments and so now we're actually going to look at what's going to take place when the first four trumpets are blown during the tribulation period. What I'd like to do is to uh, share with you the verses that I preached about last Sunday just to get us into the context of it. And I do want to say, too, um, uh, we've had some busy events going on with our family, so uh, some of our videos may not have been posted uh, according to the schedule we uh, typically keep, uh, but we'll get back on schedule here pretty soon. If you have not been keeping up with my messages out of the series on the book of Revelation, they are still available on YouTube, and uh, you may uh, also go to our church webpage, springdellfwb.org, and you will find links to them there. Uh, I think they're also on Facebook, but some of the older messages may be buried so far back in Facebook. You may not uh, have such an easy time to find them. I'm not sure about that. My son takes care of all that. and He does an excellent job. But I just wanted to say, if you've missed any of the recent books or messages on the book of Revelation, they are still available, and I uh, hope that, that you will enjoy them. As I mentioned, last Sunday's message was preparing the trumpet judgments, and uh, we looked at so many interesting things, but now we want to see exactly what's going to take place. Starting with verse number 1 of chapter 8, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints, upon the golden altar which was before the throne." And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, would you please bless this message, bless our time together today. Forgive me of my shortcomings and my sins, Lord, and help me as I stand behind this uh, sacred pulpit, this sacred desk, to preach your word. Help me to preach it in truth and in boldness. And I pray, dear Lord, that the word which gives life and light and understanding, that it would go forth and accomplish that which you intend it to do. We ask, dear Lord, that we might find encouragement in the scriptures and through the Spirit knowing that we're living in such wicked and evil days. And I pray, dear Lord, that we can see what you are doing and what you plan to do to realize that you're still in control and that nothing is going to happen to us that is not part of your permissive will and plan and that we are put here on this earth to serve you and worship you and praise you, not just through this physical life, but you want us to be with you through eternity that we may continue to sing and shout your praises. Bless us all today, I would ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, friends, you and I often spend time in preparation for things. You might be preparing a meal for someone. You might be preparing for an important event. Recently, we celebrated a wedding with my middle son and uh, his uh, fiancée, 
and they spent many months in planning the wedding. It occurred a week ago yesterday, and we had a, a wonderful celebration. I do spend a good bit of time in preparing for the messages that I preach, and also as a school teacher teaching science, I spend time preparing my lessons so that my students can learn. There are a lot of things that we spend time doing. Sadly, criminals, evil people, also spend time planning the evil that they are wanting to do. They plan their crimes and their acts of violence. Do you know that According to the scriptures, some people even lie in bed awake at night just planning what evil that they want to do. In Psalm 36, the first four verses say, The transgression of the wicked uh, saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. Here's the part about laying in bed, planning his evil. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. There are some people bent on doing things that are wicked, and they plan those events. Going down another side road, I would also like to say that in many ways, I think our government, our news media, are falsely so-called scientists. You know, the Bible does talk about that, science falsely so-called. They've pushed a deceptive narrative to the public to induce great fear over this deadly virus. The virus is real. The virus has killed many people, including people in our families and, and in our line of friends. They've planned evil to bring upon us. And, and it seems like uh, they don't mention positive things. They don't mention uh, some cures, some things that would help people, but rather they're pushing a, uh, the vaccine. And they, they also don't seem to mention about the fact that in the past we've had almost a similar number of deaths from the flu, uh, also deaths from heart attack and cancer and things like that aren't really reported at all. It's, it's just all about this virus. So as they're trying to, to push uh, this vaccine, because the, the real goal is to get everybody a vaccine identification. You know, think about the word COVID. I mentioned this, I think it was last week, C-O-V-I-D. That actually stands for C Certificate of Vaccine ID or Identification. They want everybody to have a government identification. That's what they're pushing for on this. Even though studies in Israel and Ireland have shown that about 50% of the people that have the virus now have been vaccinated, and the studies have shown that vaccines don't prevent this Delta variant, but still they're saying, well, you need to get this vaccine, you need to get booster shots, and maybe many of those. Now, I love my church family, and I love my, my natural family. And uh, many of our church family have felt the great need to take that vaccine because you want to be safe. We don't want anybody to die. We don't want anybody to get hurt. We do take safety precautions. Many people wear masks and use hand sanitizer. We have uh, sanitizing wipes and spray. Uh, in my classroom at school, after every class, we, we sanitize the desks and things that the students would come in contact with. We used calculators in my class the other day, and I said, you've got to wipe them down too, with the, the sanitizer uh, before you put them back up in my holder. So, you know, we, we are concerned about that. And I, I'm thankful that there are vaccines and, and things like that that are available uh, that uh, are helping people. But what I'm trying to get to the point is that there are many people, whether it's government, news media, or false science, that are ginning up fear. They're wanting people to be afraid. They're scaring us. Wouldn't you agree with that? With all of this and, and the nightly news that I watch sometimes, I, I often will record it and fast forward about the first five minutes is just all about this, this virus. And I, I hear it over and over again. But let's think about this idea of fear because I want to give you some encouragement today. 2 Timothy 1.7, here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear does not come from God. 
1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, Paul wrote to the Corinth church, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. This is saying then that our great and our mighty God is still in control. And as Christian saints in all the churches, we can have his peace. And the Bible calls the peace of God, it's the peace that passeth all understanding. The world does not have this peace. The devil is trying to take away your peace and your joy. Don't let fear control your lives, but rather make sure your faith and your trust is in our loving God. Many people spend a lot of time worrying about things that they imagine will be bad or things that they can't control. And all that worry is not healthy. People lose that joy in their lives. They don't have a, a very much of a happy life if they're centered on fear of what might happen. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. amen? They say that most of the things we worry about that might happen tomorrow never do happen. We waste all our time and energy on worry and worry and worry and worry about things that are really not going to happen at all. We are God's children. I hope you realize that. Our Heavenly Father is going to take care of us. He's just as he can take care of our todays and tomorrows, just like he's taken care of our yesterdays because God's in control. I promise you that there's nothing whether it be cancer, whether it be heart attack or stroke, whether it be an accident or a virus, there's nothing that can take your life before it's time for you to go. I don't know how God is going to take us from this world through the process of death, and I firmly believe that many of us will not see death, but that the Lord will come at the rapture and we'll be caught up together with those who are dead in Christ, and we're all going to receive a brand new body right then. And from that moment on, there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more death, no more disease. Amen. I hope that you feel encouraged about these things, that that, that spirit of fear, if, if you've been having fear about things in your life, that that spirit of fear would leave you because that fear is coming from the devil. That fear is not coming from God. Well, in our study, we've seen recently that as the Lord Jesus Christ opened that seventh seal, remember back in chapter number six, we saw as Jesus began to open the seals of that important book in heaven, and as he opened the seventh seal, that was at the beginning of this chapter number eight, there is a half an hour of silence, and then it's followed by a torrent of judgments, the people of the tribulation will be living in great fear and terror. Those are the ones who should be in fear. Those are the ones who are living in terror. Why? Because they don't have the Lord in their lives. We're not living in fear. Why? Because Christ Jesus is in us. We're children of the King. I, I hope I'm making sense to you today. The people without the Lord as their Savior are the ones that ought to be in fear. They ought to understand that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, that they need to get right with the Lord, and then they need not fear. But for those of us who are saved, we should not be living in fear. The Bible shows us in Revelation that there will be seven trumpet judgments, and these seven trumpet judgments are divided into two groups. The first four trumpets are recorded here in chapter number 8, and we're going to look at the rest of this chapter in just a few moments. This first group of four judgments are upon places. The last three judgments that we'll run into in the next chapter are trumpet judgments in chapter 9 that are upon persons. The first four are upon places. The last three are upon persons. When Jesus opened that sixth seal, there were great earthquakes that terrified people in the tribulation time. They were so scared that they ran to the rocks and the mountains trying to hide. And they prayed to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. But folks, it gets much worse upon the wicked on this earth during the tribulation time. Look in verse number seven. Here's the first trumpet. 
The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Wow. Hail, fire mixed with blood. It sure doesn't sound like a pretty picture, does it? In fact, it reminds me of back in Genesis 19, in verse 24, talking of Sodom and Gomorrah and God's judgment. It says in that 24th verse, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. God poured loose his judgment upon those cities of the plains. And in fact, it wasn't just those two cities. There were five cities altogether, according to Genesis 19. But this judgment, this trumpet judgment, the first trumpet, when it sounds, it's going to bring even worse because it's not only brimstone and fire, but there's also blood mixed with it as well. With it as well. Where the blood comes from, I don't know. I don't know where the fire and brimstone come from. God sends it from heaven. God can do anything, right? There's nothing that's impossible with God. So this judgment, verse 7 says, destroys a third part of the trees and the grasses. But that's only the first trumpet. Verses 8 and 9. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Wow. This huge thing, as it were, of a great mountain. It's almost like maybe there's an explosion in the earth and, and up through this massive mountain of stuff in the air burning as it's flying through the air and ends up in, and it says the sea. It doesn't say a sea, and it doesn't say all the seas. In relation to Israel, which is the perspective of the scriptures, that would probably tell us it's talking about the Mediterranean Sea. It's more localized there in that area. But notice that it affects the creatures living in the sea as well as the commerce, the ships. So the Lord blows up this great burning mountain. He sends it into the sea. And uh, this, this has got to be terrifying to people. It, it's going to be a big uh, explosion. I'm sure the ground would be shaking and tremoring. And, uh, you know, any event that happens around the world People can see by satellite TV within moments of something occurring. And imagine as people throughout the world are going to be watching this on their, their news shows and probably every channel, at, at, at all channels and continuing on for hour after hour will be talking about these things. What is going on? What is happening in the world? There's already been a lot of destruction and loss of life. And here's another great terrifying event. Let's look in verses 10 and 11. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died in the waters because they were made bitter. Well, it sounds like this is even worse than the second trumpet judgment and the first trumpet judgment. Author M.L. Moser, a preacher also who's passed on and gone on to glory, he writes about this, Wormwood is the bitterest shrub known among the, all the varieties in, uh, of the East in Syria and Palestine. It is a bitter, intoxicating, and poisonous herb which when used frequently produces convulsions, paralysis, and death. While the second trumpet sends a burning mountain through the air, the third trumpet drops a great burning star, perhaps a giant meteor, which turns the other waters bitter. So while that second trumpet is sending that burning mountain into the sea, it looks like this next trumpet is going to affect all the rest of the waters in the world. It's going to turn the waters bitter. The Bible calls it wormwood. And it tells us in the scripture that it's going to kill many people because of these bitter waters. Many people are going to die. Imagine being so thirsty you want to drink water. 
but the only water you have is contaminated. It's horrible tasting. It's poisonous. It's toxic. That doesn't sound good, does it? And I don't know for sure what's going to happen, but I, I would think that even bottles of water that might be sealed are probably also going to turn bitter. God can do that. I think all water on the earth is going to be affected. Look in verse number 12. Here's the fourth trumpet. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So trumpet number four darkens the skies. A third of the day, a third of the night. That's going to affect weather patterns. It's going to affect temperatures around the earth. They're talking about worrying about global warming. Well, that's probably going to produce some global cooling. In fact, it might get so cool that many things might freeze or spoil. Those are just four trumpet judgments. We're just getting underway in the tribulation. Of course, we won't be here then. I do not believe we're going to be here. But think about this. These things up through trumpet number six are going to take place over about the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. These judgments are very severe. They're very terrifying. Now, let me ask you a question. What did you say you're worrying about? All right, well, I didn't ask that question before, but think about it. What do you worry about in your life? Are you worrying about anything as severe and horrendous as these judgments that are going to come? I don't think we are, are we? we? We sort of get into our own little world and we think, woe is me, I'm having this trouble and this hurts and that's not working right or this thing has happened to me and, and, and we're centered in our, our own little world not realizing many times that there are other people that are worse off than we are. When our feet hurt so bad we can't hardly walk, remember there are some people that don't even have any feet, right? When, when you can't use your hands because of, of uh, disease or deformity or an accident, there are some people that have no hands and no arms. What are we worried about? Things are not near as bad as they could be. Yes, they're bad, but they could be worse. And praise God, they're not. The true Christian believers will be safe in our mansions in glory while that tribulation is going on here on the earth. That ought to excite your heart. We'll be safe in our mansions in heaven while all this is poured out upon this earth. We will be safe. We'll be lifted up above this worldwide time of horror of the tribulation. Look in verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. <laughs> so we thought it was bad. The angel says, it's going to get worse, much worse. Remember in Matthew 24, when Jesus was answering the disciples' questions about the end of the world. You know, Master, when will these things happen? When will these things take place? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus described a lot of problems, described about how there will be false Christs that will come. There are earthquakes and famines. There's pestilence. That's disease. I think some of these diseases are going to get worse and worse. Other viruses are things that are going to come upon us. And wars and rumors of wars. And Jesus said, see that you be not troubled. Because he said, these are just the beginnings of sorrows. Jesus says it's going to get worse. But that will be worse for the unbelievers who are left behind after the rapture. So here in this verse, verse 13, the angel is announcing that the three remaining trumpet judgments will be even more severe. And those trumpets are directed toward persons. The three remaining ones, remember I said the first four are toward places but the three remaining are directed toward persons and there will be a loss of many lives. Think about this. When your life is over, where are you going to be? Will it be heaven 
will be hell. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? In the middle of the storms of life, understand that God has hope for us, for his children. And our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel message is that Jesus saves. I've got to turn around just for a second and get my projector going. I have a short PowerPoint that I'd like to share with you about 9-11 and the Bible. And you might be able to see up here in the pulpit, there's a, a model that my middle son had given me a, a couple of uh, times at uh, different times of the twin towers with a flag wrapped around it and over here is a cross with a flag wrapped around it this is of great significance to what i want to share with you in uh in this little presentation and i think i'm going to step off to the side just a little bit and so as we take a look here is the uh the twin tower picture i put up there 9 11 uh, of 20 uh, 2001 so I'm calling this the Bible and 9-11, 2001. And I have a portion of the verse of Matthew 7, 27 up there. Great was the fall of it. Now this is interesting because in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7, Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5, he tells us about uh, how we are to turn the other cheek. He said, you've heard it has been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, and uh, Jesus teaches us uh, about being forgiving and compassionate. And when we get to chapter 7, Jesus is telling the story of the wise man and the foolish man. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And Jesus said the rains came, the floods came. The wise man's house stood, uh, stood firm, but the foolish man's house fell. Jesus said, and great was the fall of it a building that fell in a great way. Here are some pictures of that particular time, and I remember vividly, I know exactly where I was and what I was doing. I had emergency eye surgery on September 1st. I was at home watching the news that morning and just could hardly believe my eyes. Seeing the buildings hit and burning was bad enough, but what really just about broke my heart, and as I prayed for people, there were people standing at the windows of some of the upper floors, waving jackets, sweaters, shirts, wanting somebody to rescue them. They wanted to be saved, and nobody could save them. Fire and rescue people, so brave. The policemen and, and firemen went up through the stairwells trying to save some people, and they did rescue some, but most of the stairwells were blocked with the debris of what happened that day. Helicopters couldn't get near the building because of the great winds and updraft. There was no helicopter pads on the roof because of all the antennas and the cables. And those people needed somebody to save them. And then pretty soon they began just to jump. That just broke my heart. I would see them falling through the air. The sound was hard to take. And I cried and I prayed and I prayed. God would deliver them and protect them. And then we hear word of the Pentagon being hit. All this happened in less than an hour. And another airplane in western Pennsylvania had, had been flying toward Cleveland and then turned and started heading back, not knowing for sure where it was going. But a tower collapsed and within minutes the other tower also collapsed. And pretty soon there was just rubble and debris left there in New York City like this. The fascinating thing about this, as they took months and months to clean this up, was there were at least two portions of the Bible found in this debris of these buildings. That's what I want to focus on. Here's one of them. You can see Bible pages are fused to this metal, and it's almost heart-shaped, which I think is interesting. And this portion of the scripture is from Matthew 5 up there in the top, and then it's ripped down toward the bottom, which reveals part of chapter 7. 
It was found by a fireman. This was at the end of March 2002. And the fireman saw a reporter who had been there every day for nine months, taking pictures, watching the progress. And so the fireman come down from that upper level where he had been working to where the photographer was, hollering at him and waving that piece of metal. And he gave it to the photographer, who later on in 2010 donated it to a, a museum, that National Memorial Museum. But it was fragments of steel with fused Bible pages of Matthew 5 and 7. It shows part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. On the top is Matthew 5, 36 through 42 that I mentioned, and then part of Matthew 7 is underneath. Here's a close-up of that exact find. And if you look at it, you can see the verses there where it says 38, 39. That was that part about Jesus telling us to be forgiving, to turn the other cheek. It says here, Luke 60, uh, 6, Luke 6, 27, about love, but this really is the passage from Matthew 5. Um, and then this part underneath here, where it's ripped away, is Matthew 7. And if you can see, and I know it's not real easy to, but you can see, and it fell. Part of this is hidden, but it said, and great was the fall of This is Jesus talking about those, the buildings. I tried to zoom in a little bit more, and even though, again, this says 627, this really is 527 under, or 727 under there, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And the Bible says, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Another Bible scripture was found at a different time and a different location. And again, this is not all that easy for us to see. You might be able to make out the number 11. And this is actually taken from Genesis chapter 11, which is a story of the Tower of Babel. I mean, isn't this amazing? One portion of the scripture that was found talks about a building that collapsed. Great was the fall of it. And the other portion of scripture is talking about a man-made tower. From Genesis chapter number 11. And I'll share with you the first four verses. Again, you can kind of see that 11 up there near the top. And it's, it is blurry. It's not easy to read that. But here is a scripture that was found on that piece of metal. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. That's the land of Babylon, modern-day Iraq. And they said one to another, go to. In our modern language, if we were talking about us as a group doing something, we might say, come on. In Old English, they said, go to. It means the same thing as, come on. Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly, and they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. They wanted to make a great tower to get up to heaven where God was. That was pretty foolish. Heaven's not close enough where you can build your way from the earth. So they said, let us build, a, uh, build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. That's arrogance, and that's mockery of God. God will not be mocked. Something else was found, and that's why I held this up just a little while ago. Some of the steel girders that they found were in the shape of a cross. You can see it's kind of littered with other pieces of metal and other debris. But the workers decided they needed to save that, that that was an important piece. In fact, here is that same metal girder today. It, it's on a concrete pedestal. And someone says it stands as a symbol of the ultimate act of God's love. It stands littered with our trash, just like the cross of Calvary was littered with our sin. Jesus took our sin upon himself. Paul says, as Christ took our sin, he nailed it to the cross. 
It stands rising from the rubble, and nothing on earth can bring down the cross of Jesus Christ. They can destroy this man-made object, but they can't destroy the cross that God made. The truth is, the man can't take steel and concrete and build a tower to make a way to heaven. The Bible teaches us there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. But God made a cross on which his son, Jesus Christ, made a way to heaven for us. I shared this PowerPoint and these Bible verses and this background with my students in class on Friday. All of my students who were present there got to hear this. And I didn't leave it at that. I also told them as, as we're worried about things that are happening in the future, God has an answer. And I shared with them Acts 16.31, which says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And I told them, you need to know God. You need to know Jesus. And I pleaded with them. I didn't preach it as a, an invitation like in a sermon, but I did share this from my heart. And I wanted them to know. We talked a little bit about some other things, about the wicked times that we're living in. We know the man of sin, the Antichrist, is coming. But I said, don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Because the Bible tells me that Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. There's only one answer to man's sin problem. And that answer is the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, I wish everybody knew Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. I can't save you. I couldn't even save myself. But what I can do is tell others about Jesus, who loves every man, woman, and child so much that he was willing to go to Calvary's cross to save us from our sin. Do you know Jesus today? Josiah, if you'll come with a song of invitation, I'd like to ask everyone to just bow your heads and hearts there. You can remain in your pews. But let us pray. Lord, as we studied here in Revelation chapter 8, the coming judgments are going to be so terrible, so horrible, so horrendous, that it's, it's just going to seem like there's no hope for mankind. But the hope for mankind is in Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. That the invitation during this age of grace is for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Lord, perhaps whether it's people here in this congregation today or, or whether it's people watching this recording at some future date, that Lord Jesus, you help them to come to a saving knowledge of you. And for those that do know you as Lord and Savior, that Lord, they may make sure that they're walking close to you and living in obedience to you and be prepared in their hearts and lives to know that you're coming soon and that it's so important that they be ready. Lord, we can say that, in a sense, we see this world going to hell. And I know at the rapture there will not be one Christian left upon the face of this earth. And that's why it's so important that people get saved today, that they get saved now, because in that tribulation, it's not going to be easy to get saved. There are Jews... Those 144,000 that you will seal and protect, that will be trying to tell others to refuse the mark of the beast, and those that are willing to refuse it and to hear and believe the message of your witnesses, they'll probably forfeit their physical lives. But you already told us in the Scriptures, Christ, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It's so much more important that people be willing to give up this physical life to gain eternal life if that's what is required. Lord, would you bless your church? Please comfort each and every one of us. Yes, we are scared and worried about this virus spreading and, and about the uneasiness in the world and the threats of wars and rumors of wars. But help us to have that peace that you and you alone can give to us knowing that our lives are in your hands and nothing can happen to us except that which you allow to happen. 
and that your plans and purposes for us are wonderful and that one day you'll take us out of this world and take us to our heavenly home. I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you, Heavenly Father and Holy Spirit. And Lord, I, I thank you for allowing me to preach and to teach your word. And I pray, dear Lord, you will take the truths that I've shared today and make them real in hearts and lives. Lord, I, a heart goes out to families who have lost loved ones from 9-11 and the, the days that followed. But yet, dear Lord, I'm so glad that there were pages of the Bible that were preserved through that fire, through that collapse, and that those pages show clearly that you're in control. Lord, I just wish everybody would turn to the Holy Scriptures and pray in the name of Jesus and, and just ask you to lead them and to teach them and to save their sin-sick soul. Lord, if there's anybody here today that needs to pray for repentance, pray for salvation, rededication, whatever their need may be, Lord, would you meet that need through the power of your Spirit and your Word. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.